Ready? Yeah? I have 130 slides. Can everybody read? Please steal this idea. It takes two minutes to make. Okay, cool. Oh, echo. No? There we go, okay. Hi, my name is Olof Woge. I'm a senior software developer. I work at Factlines in Norway, here in Norway. And this is my handle on most places, and you can come yell at me on the internet. <laughs> that is a feature of the internet. So, the place where you live right now, oh, it's pretty good, right? There are probably things you would like to fix and, and things you probably do completely differently, but this is your place right now, right? Uh, and probably things that you love and you wouldn't trade for the world. But then you get the news. You have to move. Oh, stressful, right? Yeah. Uh, the move is going to take a lot of work, and there are a lot of unknown unknowns as well. Uh, it's also, also going to take you a lot of time and money to move. But you hope that in the end, it's going to be worth it, right? Yeah. So system migrations <laughs> are, a way, are in a way like moving to a new place. The new system is better, right? We're hosting in a new, better place. Oh, it's written in this cool new language. Oh, everybody loves that one. Uh, and all of the 2020 hindsights are accounted for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. All the design fixes a lot of the older design issues, and it totally has any new unforeseen consequences. Uh, yeah, we can ignore that. So migration isn't, very, isn't a very exciting topic. Uh, but when you're tasked with doing it, it is really tricky. And you hope that the internet, the place we are now, right, is full of great tips and tricks to guide you along. So here I am contributing to that ecosystem. And here are the things that I have learned from doing system migrations. There are many types of migrations as well. And if you go on Google and you search for migration, one thing that you might pop up is the seven R's of modernization. Relocate, rehost, replatform, refactor, rearchitect, rebuild, and repurpose. Yes, they really wanted to force the R's on that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this list is a good resource. Please use it. But it also, a lot, a lot of it revolves around what you can do on the cloud end, uh, like switching cloud providers or moving to a new system. That's OK. This talk is mostly on the rebuild and re-architect. So we're going to do a whole new thing. We're not going to just take the thing and just pop it over in another place. So this will also be about moving or doing the migration all at once, which is also pretty tricky. Uh, some migration strategies revolve around having both systems alive at the same time. Like, also there's another one where you rebuild a small part of the system in a kind of a ship of Theseus way, where you slowly replace one plank at a time while the system is alive, while you're sailing the seven seas. This will also not be that. This is a one swoop over. Good. So recently, I was working as a consultant for a company that was doing a new platform, brand new platform, file new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you love that one, right? File new? Yes, I love that too. So it's a whole new apartment, out with the old, in with the new. Um, the company is a B2B company. It had a legacy system. And let's call that system S2. That's the old system. Good. Uh, it was standard B2B fare, users, companies, users access to the companies, and some data. Some, some <coughs> data that you have to store in the system. The code in the new system, which is very in ingeniously called S3, had nothing to do with the code of S2. Like we said, file new. Oh, I love that one. S2 was PHP and MySQL, which is fine. S3 was full stack TypeScript and Postgres. Uh -huh. There was also an old school hosting provider involved somewhere. I'll show you that in a bit. Uh, and S3 would be hosted in the cloud. It's like we're doing, like, what's the worst case of the worst case of the worst case, right? Not good. And like I mentioned in the moving analogy, they had learned what not to do when it came to the design of the new system, how the data should be structured, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that the data model in S3 did not match the data model in S2. There were vastly different pre and post conditions, and which basically meant you could not clone the database of S2 into the cloud 
for S3. It wasn't the same thing. There were also features in S2 that were not moving to S3, and there were features in S3 that did not exist in S2. I'm keep stacking on these worst-case scenarios, right? <laughs> now, because I'm stacking on to worst-case scenarios, here's a fun twist. There's a reason why I call the systems S2 and S3. Who can guess? Maybe from the title of the talk. Because yes, S1 <laughs> existed as well. S1 was still in active use. <laughs> S1 contained important data with important customers. And yes, S1's data model did not match S2 or S3's data model. Because obviously, the people that designed S2 learned from the design of S1, <laughs> right? So this was one of the core reasons why we decided to not do the double writes and not move the system slowly over, because we would have had to do it, do it twice. So instead of having three platforms, three databases, two hosting services, and having two double write migration systems live at the same time, we decided to migrate both S1 and S2 into S3 all at once on the same day. Ready? <laughs> Who has the computer? <laughs> so spoilers, we did. It's about a year ago. It went really well, as well as a migration can go, but it went really well. And so this talk, after all the preamble, here are the tips that I'm going to give you so that hopefully that you also will have an excellent migration. Ready? Yes. <laughs> of course, a big asterisk. I couldn't make it bigger, but I wanted it bigger. <laughs> like with any list of things, there are things that work for us. You know, all the preamble. You should totally pick and choose from my list and throw away the stuff that you don't like. Right? Your migration is going to be its own unique thing. So use this as a resource, throw away stuff, adapt what you want. Cool. So number one, the actual migration, like when you do it, should be the most boring part of the entire process. It sounds obvious, but this needs to be the mantra when you are preparing for the migration. The point of doing all the hard work beforehand is to make the actual migration as mundane as possible. Okay. The next tips should help you achieve that. Write the migration as code in a strongly typed language. It's very tempting to write co uh, the migration as a collection of database queries. Please don't. <laughs> write it as code, and that code should be strongly typed to avoid any accidental apples to oranges comparisons, because you will have those. Model all of the data of both systems, or in our case, all three systems, as separate types, and write code to convert between them. This, again, might sound obvious to people, but this is something that needs to be said. A user in old system is not the same as user in new system, even if the data is almost the same. So we have old system user with some data, and new system user almost the same, something there, something not there, and your migration is a convert function. And that is your canonical way to go between old user and new user. This is the thing again and again. The code itself isn't that interesting. There will be code in the slides. Uh, it is from the actual migration, but I changed a bunch of stuff because, you know, slides. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is Iceland. Woo. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah, if you want the pictures, the sources are in the corner. Uh, split the migration into as many discrete steps as you possibly can. Think of the migration of users, for example, in the old system to new system as its own isolated migration. Find the leaves in the design and split them into their own migration steps. The, your entire migration system is then just those steps performed in the same order again and again. Here's an example. User import, company import, license import, user company import, and then there's the function that do that. And within those functions, you can call them and they are very isolated. They do the work by themselves. Don't run your migration multi-threaded. Please, there is an asterisk though. Migration in strong and well-defined sequential steps will cut down on so many edge cases. Yes, it might take a little bit more time, but remember, rule number one, make it boring. <laughs> asterisk, if you're 100% sure, fine. But don't tell me, it's like I warned you, basically. <laughs> 
uh, this is the big one for us. Assert, throw, and crash on anything that might look out of the ordinary. This value should always be here. Cool. Prove it. Put an assert there. This array is never empty. Cool. Prove it. Put an assert there. Mm -hmm. Add hundreds of these. I think we had hundreds. If the migration did not trigger any of these, then, knock on wood, this, we should be okay, right? An example, just, I mean, the members should never be null. Then we can use the member. The call from that function should never be, what is it? Yeah, should, should not be nully or falsy. It's just a collection of these again and again and again. So again, very boring, very mundane, but this is important. Log as much as you can, like the pun? Okay. <laughs> as much as you can into a separate file. Logging not just to see what you did, but it's also a great way to get an overview of the data that you just created. Wait, there's a user type called editor, but there are no users with editor type. Well, that might change how you do and write the actual migration code. Comment like you've never commented before. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are gonna be so many little edge cases, so many little nuances to think about, right? Oh, we can do this operation on every user, except the ones before 2011, because there was a bug and they look a little different. That's a comment. Like, you had that meeting, that's a comment. So this is an example. I can't show you the code, but for those who have written TypeScript, the imports are at the bottom there. This is a comment before one migration of just all of the preconditions, assumptions that we've been doing. This is really important. And we refer back to this again and again. Here's another file. We also do it. This is the scroll bar. I couldn't zoom out enough. <laughs> we structured it. We made like little tables out of it and we made it cute, right? So yeah, we were very analytical in doing all this. Uh, I, li I love this one. Progress bars are surprisingly useful, right? It sounds like an unimportant thing, but it's one of the more useful things when we were doing the migration because migrations take time and they deal with a lot of data. So a visual indication that something is happening is very important. And if you change something which causes it to get stuck, you know immediately because, you know, the progress bar is stuck. Again, very simple. Just import progress bar, beat it in a command line, you can do in whatever you want. Yep. Perform test migrations while you're doing the migrations. So the code you're writing is supposed to convert old data into the new system. So do that and reset if it worked. Are you done writing the user migration? Cool, run it. Are you done with the company migration? Cool, run the user migration, followed by the company migration. Yeah. And do these migration in as real of an environment as possible, because latency matters. If you do it locally, cool, it's really fast. But they run it against AWS, and wow, it takes half an hour. Like, yeah, okay. Uh, this is a very sad but true one. You're almost certainly going to have to read and or run some of that code again. Yes, so be nice to your future self. <laughs> be thankful for all those asserts and all those beautiful comments and those well-named functions and classes, right? Yeah. We all do that? Yes, of course we do. Because there's going to be that one customer where you just, you got it wrong. So you can have to rerun some of those migrations. So again, also thank you, thank yourselves for having the migrations as isolated steps because this again helps you with that. Um, store unique IDs from the old system in the new system. Don't use them for anything, just have them there. So ID name, email, legacy ID, right? Because you're going to get a call from support. <laughs> Why does the data look like that? It wasn't like that in the old system. And you're going to thank yourself for keeping that old ID somewhere. This, is, this has come back again and again. So, and as simple as that, you have an S3 company, ID name, and then S1 ID, S2 ID which might not be there, might be there. Yeah, it's as simple as that. It's okay to write custom code for that one weird case, or many weird cases, because migration is never a clean process, and you're going to find a subset of data that just doesn't fit nicely with a normal migration. That's fine. Then treat that weird case as its own thing, because it is. So here's an example. This is actually from the migration. I re rewritten some of the, the commenting, but there was unset data, I call it, in the, in the thing. It was called something else, but it doesn't matter. But the data wasn't linked correctly, but then there was data that was linked correctly. So instead of migrating the thing by itself, it's migrated in two steps. One as the unset data, and one as the set data. There were two migrations. 
and we did them in this order. So yeah, this is very important. There are things that you don't migrate. This is also normal, right? Perhaps the old system allowed you to delete data and leave a foreign key broken, yeah? Or the design of the feature in the new system needs data that just was never saved in the old system. So of course you don't have that data. You're going to have to make a decision on how to move forward and you need to document why this data wasn't migrated. Or, this happened to us in a few cases, you might not have to migrate the data because the feature was only used by a customer and that customer is no longer a customer. So this is also a thing you can detect. So again, just simple as this, doing checks. There was a, and this is actual code just rewritten a little bit. There was some stuff that was duplicate that we just tweeted as the, the first ID. And because you have, uh, like the old system isn't gonna change when you do the migration, the ID should stay, say, should stay stable. That's a sentence, should stay stable. Um, yeah, some data we don't migrate, some data that we treat as another data, that's totally fine. Uh, here's an actual function, again, rewritten a little bit. So this is actual user import. We have a progress bar. We get the S2 users, map them to S3 users. We start the progress bar. We start a transaction for every user. We update or import. Uh, this is for S2 because we did S1 first, and then we there are users in S2 that also exist in S1, so we update them accordingly, and that's it. I mean, it's a, it's it's not very exciting code, but it's going to be a lot of code, and you should make it boring. So, you all took that in, right? This is all now saved in your brain. So this was a lot, I guess, right? So, here are some fun stats. It was about 30,000 lines of code, okay? Not because it's interesting that it's 30,000 lines of code, uh, it's the ratio that I want to show you. Because only about 1,000 of those lines had to do with S3. Because that was just CRUD, maybe not the, the D of CRUD, but it was create, read, update. We didn't do much deleting of the new one, right? Because uh, the rest of the code was, how do I do this? How do I, how do I take this S1, S2 data and convert it? Or how do I deal with this, with this weird edge case? That was about 14,000 lines of each for S1 and S2. So just to give you the ratio of the S3 code was very boring, the uh, S2 and S1 code was, how do I take this data and do something with it and convert it over to the S3 code? Uh, duh, duh, yep. So, more fun facts. Uh, it was written in TypeScript, and because, so the system is in TypeScript, and this was written in TypeScript, th some of that code, the migration code, found it, was it the, well, the <laughs> being, ended up being the basis for some of our testing setup because this was th about dealing with the data and handling the data, so this was the basis for a test setup. Um, also, because this was split into isolated migrations, we could do the actual migration on the day in many steps. So we could have run it all at once, we didn't, which is fine. But because it was split uh, down, we could, uh, we could do this in many steps. Uh, this was my favorite comment, uh, because, yeah, I was very likely tired. If it used to be associated with the feature but isn't anymore, then I don't migrate it because I never about of it. <laughs> yeah, I never about of it. Do you about of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So don't, don't code tired. <laughs> so for those who have phones, want to take a photo? You can do that right now. I'm probably okay on time. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Any thoughts, questions, angry rants? We have a recording, so. <laughs> Where's that? Yeah? Thank you. Yeah? Oh, we can talk after. <laughs>